Okay, so I have a lot of ideas jumbling around in my head right now, so let's see if I can make it make sense. All right, I am starting three different 18th century projects, and I'm in a bit of a time crunch, so I'm going to try and do them as efficiently as possible. <laughs> the first one I'm going to make is a jacket out of this brown silk wool blend from Burnley and Trowbridge. It's kind of a little bit thicker. It has a decent like body and weight to it and a little bit of a texture. It's nice stuff. I think it'll work great. <sighs> okay, 18th century. I have dabbled in 18th century. I've done a lot of like study, um, but as far as actually making stuff, I basically only did like history bounding and outlander costuming, like not, not like aiming for any kind of historical accuracy. This time I am aiming for a little bit more historical accuracy, but with an asterisk. I'm not a reenactor. Nobody relies on me being perfectly historically accurate. So I'm just trying to make stuff that I enjoy wearing, that I will have fun, you know, taking out to reenactments that I'll have fun working on. So let's look at the possibilities. To make my jacket, I'm going to be primarily referencing these two books, Janet Arnold's Patterns of Fashion 1, the old version, I don't have the new one yet, and Nora Waugh's The Cut of Women's Clothing. There are several jacket samples in each that I've been comparing and contrasting, and the first thing I notice is how great of a variety there is in 18th century jackets, which does make sense. Jackets were smaller items for daily wear. You had a lot of room to express your individuality with a jacket. They were cheaper to make, requiring less fabric. They were often remade and restyled. Just look at this example. The silk from this jacket is dated to the 1710s, while the jacket's style dates it between 1730 and 1750, meaning that it was probably made from a scrapped silk gown or petticoat. However, it has been altered, embellished, and the sleeves lengthened, refashioning it for the 1770s. My point is that I'm not too worried about sticking to one particular decade with my design. Contradictions are perfectly historically accurate, and so I'm going to do what I like. There are common elements that I see in jackets, though. They usually have less back seams than a gown would, though some styles had a lot more. They usually have either a separate flared skirt portion, or they have wide flares and pleats to give the skirt ease over the petticoats and padding. Sometimes they even have gores. Sometimes the skirts are longer, and sometimes they're very short. Sometimes there is what might appear like a princess seam to the modern critic. However, the purpose of a modern princess seam is to make room for the natural bust shape. These seams are made to give flair to the front of the skirt. And there is another possible element that I'm seeing. A slit between the skirt and the peak of the bodice, allowing them to flare out as one piece. So, taking all of this, what do I want my jacket to look like? I don't want to have a separate flared skirt. I want smooth, seamless pieces. I just like them the best. I want to have those large box pleats opening beneath the vertical seams. I will be using this jacket with my stomachers, so even though I like the look of this design, I don't think that it's suitable for this project. Instead, I'll do a vertical seam in the front to flare out the skirt. Mostly because I don't really want to have a gore like this jacket does. I want the neckline to slope down right along the sides of my stomacher. I also want the hem to be a bit longer. Probably not as long as this jacket, but I have two yards of fabric to work with, so we'll see what I can do. And I think that's good for now. I don't even want to think about sleeves yet. Okay, now, discussing my pattern for this project, I am going to be reusing one of my old patterns. This is my chintz vine dress that I made like, what, three years ago, two and a half years ago at this point. This was my first 18th century style dress that I made, and I made it to be kind of like generically 18th century. I wasn't trying to do anything too specific. And it was a history bounding dress, so I, you know, I gave it short sleeves. There's a zipper down the back. I did what I wanted. However, I already know that it fits me, and the fact that it's a bit more generic makes it like a perfect pattern to kind of start out with. I will need to do some changes in the front. I have a seam going here that I'm probably going to eliminate, and then because it was a history bounding dress, I raised the neckline a little bit, but then I found it to be gapy, so I added a little drawstring to bring it back in. So yeah, this is the pattern that I'm starting with, and I haven't worked with it in so long. I have no idea what I did to it. I opened up the packaging and it was like uh, heavily altered, <laughs> but I have no idea what project that was for. <laughs> so luckily this is one of the patterns that I have size graded and put up on my Patreon, and I still had a backup 
of my original unaltered pattern, and let's just get to it. <laughs> Okay, being real with you, 18th century patterning is actually very simple once you kind of understand how the pieces work. They look kind of foreign to us if you are more used to modern sewing, but because they're trying to turn your body into a cone shape, they're actually very simple and easy to alter. If you want to see me go into a lot more depth with starting from scratch and fitting and altering a pattern to your body, I would recommend checking out the part one video of that chintz vine dress. But what I did here is I lined up all of these pieces seam to seam, ignoring the curves of that side back seam, and traced everything as one new pattern piece. I also trimmed down the pattern pieces to the waistline, since I'll be adding a brand new skirt pattern to it later. Once the pattern had been traced out as one piece, I ignored all of the previous seam placements and then just completely started from scratch and drew my own new ones. For the side back seam, since it is a little bit further in than the original seam with the waist tucking in, I just kind of freehanded that following roughly where the curves widened and narrowed together. And it worked pretty well. Like, <laughs> I didn't even end up having to alter that seam at all. I just realized that none of these seem to have a like separate shoulder strap piece. It's all kind of connected towards the back, but it is one piece with the front. So I just made that adjustment. And I altered the neckline to look a little bit more like this one because this one has a neckline that kind of slopes to fit with the stomacher and it looks a bit more like that. So I have this for now, um, but we'll see. I'm, I gotta do a mock-up and see what I'm looking at. I think there are definitely some little things that I want to tweak. I think I'm going to raise the back neckline a little bit. I think that that just lies a little bit lower than I want, but pinching it along the back, it feels very like flat and smooth and solid. So I don't think any of those seams need altered. I think that my guesstimations worked out pretty well. The front is a little bit trickier. Of course, this is the one that I was, you know, deviating from the original pattern the most. I think what I'm going to have to do is use this side front seam here and just like bring it in a little bit, pinch it in a little bit so that I can kind of take out some of the ease right here and kind of smooth and force the stomacher to sit a little bit flatter against my stomach. Uh, let's see, the neckline I think is pretty good. It kind of like comes up a little bit higher um, so I could round that a little bit more. I don't think I need to make any other mock-up. I'm going to mark the lines along the side seam where I think it needs to be brought in and then I'm going to trace it out onto paper and start adding the skirt flare pieces. So here is the little bit of rounding that I'm doing on that corner of the neckline and then here is where I measured out that there was too much ease below this front seam. So that's really all that I need to do this mock-up other than what I'm going to add up here but yeah, that was that went pretty smooth. Okay, next round of edits. I uh, panicked and decided to add a side seam. I don't know, like I'm just like concerned that this was too wide of a stretch to like flare out over my hips, especially with all the like skirt layers. Uh, I don't know, we'll see. Um, the other thing I did is, let's see, I altered this front seam down here to give that a little bit of a curvature. I peeled away a little bit from the center front seam and then kind of give this round swoop. And then up here for the back neck, I raised it, I brought it in and I kind of gave it a little bit more of a blocky blunt kind of joint. Typically 18th century stuff isn't as rounded as I originally had it. It's a little bit more like pieced looking. So yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I should do this. Oh no, I don't know. All of the 18th century stuff that I looked at, like, seemed to do okay without a giant seam. <sighs> okay, I won't do it. I'll tape it back together. <sighs> okay, here's what I've come up with, and here's what I'm gonna go with. I have added a nice skirt to each one of them. On the skirts, I popped out 
the flare to about 30 degrees. I actually just eyeballed it and then I measured it and it was about 30 degrees. Um, and then of course I added two inches onto the uh, side back seam and the center back seam, which will be a pleat in addition to that 30 degrees. For a fabric, I already told you about this one. This is my silk wool blend. This will be the outer fabric. This is a linen canvas. It's pretty stiff and rigid, has a lot of structure to it. This will be like an internal layer. I'm not going to do this over the whole garment, but I will use it in like certain more structural places. And then this is just plain old linen from Joann's. This is going to be the lining. In cutting these out, I have been doing half inch seam allowances everywhere except for the side back and the center back seams. I'm doing three quarters of an inch just so that there is a little bit of flexibility for size changing in the future. Um, I'm marking pretty well these corners for the pleats. I'm also lengthening the hem a bit as it gets closer to the back. Because it's going to be long enough to go over the hips and the bum roll, I don't want it to like be coming up short in the back. So if I have to trim it shorter later, I will, but for now I thought it was better just to add a bit of length. Woop woop, all cut out. Um, I'm gonna be quitting for today, but there goes patterning, mock-up, alterations, and cutting out one full work day. I feel like I should warn you, with the patterning of this jacket, I was attempting to be as historically accurate as I could. However, with the construction, that is all going out the window. I was on a time crunch to make this jacket, so it wasn't so much about enjoying the process of sewing as it was about cranking out a finished product, and I had zero intention of hand sewing this entire piece. So the order of operations that I used might look a little bit bonkers, but it will make sense in the end, and it did work out. So to start out, I pinned each linen canvas interlining piece to the bodices of the corresponding silk panels. At the machine, I basted all the way around these pieces at about 3 eighths of an inch, except for the waistline. I did not sew through the waistline because if I did, then it would show in the final product. Then I took these over to the ironing board and gave them a good press. And now I'm lining up the center front panels with the side front panels and pinning them together and then I'm going to sew all the way down that seam at a half inch. I clipped and ironed the seam open, and now I'm going to take all of the panels and start sewing together the skirt pieces, just the skirt parts. Iron those open, and then I'm also going to sew together the shoulder seams. Iron those open. And this is what it currently looks like. Completely sewn together along the skirt, but open along all of the back panels. Now I simply need to repeat that entire process with my lining linen. So now I have two identical shapes, whatever these are, <laughs> and I'm going to line them up right sides together and I'm going to pin all the way around, starting at the center back neckline, going over the shoulders, down the front edge, all the way down the skirt, around the skirt, and then back up to the center neckline. I'm going to be stitching all the way around that entire piece at a half of an inch, and then clipping all of the curves and corners and turning the whole thing right side out through the open back seams. Then I took it back to my machine and I edge stitched all the way around the lining. Underneath, all of the seams have been folded to the inside and I'm stitching about an eighth of an inch from the edge. And I did this along the entire neckline, front edge, and skirt. Now I'm taking it to the ironing board and pressing everything flat. That edge stitching really helps with this part and it makes the final result look much nicer. And there you go. This is what it currently looks like all in one piece. Next, I'll need to finish these three back seams. Okay, closing up these back seams. Not actually that complicated, but still time consuming. First I smoothed together the outer and the lining layers and started pinning down those open seams until they looked like this. Then I went to the machine and I added a row of basting stitches around all of those open seams. And now it looks like this. 
and then I folded the seams together and began pinning down to the pleat. At the machine I stitched them with a 3 quarter inch seam allowance because that is what I left when I was initially cutting it out. And then to begin finishing those seams, I trimmed down the lining and the interlining layers, and just left the brown silk layer at its full width. I folded the selvage of the brown silk layer over and around the two lining layers, and then pinned it down. And then I felt it in place, making sure that I was only stitching through the lining and possibly the interlining layer, but not ever the silk layer. This was pretty time consuming, but kind of satisfying to work on. And then for the second side, as I was stitching it, I also trimmed down the fuzzy edge at the top of the pleat and then folded it flat and tacked it into place. When I was done, they looked like this. For one final touch, I ironed the pleats. However, I did use a pressing cloth since I was ironing on the facing side of the silk, which I should probably do more often, basically just for the practice because I couldn't see what I was doing and I kept ironing more wrinkles into the silk. Okay, well, there is good and bad to talk about right here. I did, as I am wont to do, get it just a tiny bit too tight, I think. I think the stomacher will barely fit inside, but it might be a little tiny bit gappy. Um, two, I think that the back looks fantastic. However, the side, I was really debating whether or not I should put another like central side seam and another flare over the hip. I wasn't sure it could make it over my hip without wrinkling, and as it turns out, it cannot. So there's a bit of like a lift right here. Because it's a little bit tight and because I'm concerned about it gapping around the edges of the stomacher, I might put lacing cords. I have seen historical jackets like this with lacing cords. It's not like, I don't believe it would be too costumey, but I'm just concerned with the edges barely like gaping around the edges of the stomacher instead of like covering it all up like it's supposed to. And also I don't really like having all the pins and everything. Like I, I know that that's accurate, but I don't enjoy it. <laughs> so yeah, if I could have this panel be laced up so that it sits more smoothly and so that I don't have to wear pins in it, that would be great. After thinking about it for a while, I might have stumbled across the reason why my stuff always turns out too tight. I like my things to be form-fitting, but too tight is too tight, and I think what always happens is I make my mock-up to fit perfectly, but the mock-up is just one layer, it's not got all of the finishings, it's just a rough draft. And I tend to cut things super close to the line of being too tight, and then when I make the final garment, like in this case, there were three layers, there were, you know, bulky seam finishings, I was wearing it over more layers than I did when I wore the mock-up. So it just kind of tends to end up being a little bit too tight. The eyelets ended up being a great remedy for this situation. I wasn't planning on doing them originally, but I'm really glad that I had the excuse to do them, basically. I love the way they look. However, after I finished the eyelets, I did decide to go back and open up the two side back seams and then sew them about a quarter of an inch closer to the selvage, which gave me a total extra one inch of ease for the bodice. Okay, I printed out that sleeve over there, uh, basically as is. I might have guesstimated it a little bit too large, so I took out an inch from the middle of it, and then I kind of tapered these edges in a little bit. This is supposed to be just a very, very, very rough pattern that I'm now going to mock up and edit from there, and hopefully it's not so terrible. With the sleeve pattern, my goal is basically to make the simplest, most generic 18th century sleeve pattern I can, so that in future 18th century projects I can just adapt this one instead of having to start from scratch. I want it to be all one piece, I want it to curve down around my elbow, and I don't want it to be super loose and baggy, but I would like for it to be at least loose enough to be comfortable. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, here's the sleeve and it's honestly not that bad. It's a little bit loose. I think I'm going to take like a solid half inch out of either side of this like underarm seam. And I think that I set it in the shoulder a little bit crooked. It's kind of tilted a little too forward. It needs to go back a bit. But it's nice and loose and comfortable, even though, you know, this jacket is very, very tight and close to my body. So it needs to be a little bit flexible in order to move correctly. And I think I'm basically just going to go with it. I don't really care for these puffs right here, but I'm not entirely sure how to get rid of those. Other than that, when I pin it in for real, I'll just kind of shift the pleats a little bit further back. I don't know, like, it's, I think it's fine. <laughs> As you can see, when I pinned in my mock-up, the edges did not fit perfectly inside the arm's eye because the original sleeve was probably shaped for a different arm's eye. So since I had cut it big, I kind of let it overlap and sit the way it wanted to sit. And then before I seam ripped it out, I went and trimmed off anything that was overhanging the seam allowance. Then I went and trimmed the pattern just a little bit more. I trimmed a half of an inch from the seam allowance. I sort of trimmed and rounded out those harsh edges where I'd cut around the pleats. And then I kind of trimmed down and refined the shape of the cuff a little bit more. Honestly, I was not expecting the sleeve pattern to go this quickly or to turn out this nice. But you know what? It worked. It, it was not as hard as I expected, which seems to be the theme of 18th century patterning. Tracing that out onto paper, the only thing that I further modified was to add a little bit onto the upper edge of that sleeve cuff. It just kind of came up across the inner elbow a little bit higher than I wanted. So yes, now it's time to cut it out. However, I did not have enough fabric left over to cut out all one piece sleeves. If I had cut the sleeves into two pieces, I probably could have done it, but I really wanted to try this all one piece pattern. So I ended up needing to do a little bit of piecing. I stitched together the pieces and then ironed open all the seams. And then I cut out a lining from this brown lightweight linen. I will not be doing the heavy canvas interlining for the sleeves. To sew them together, I stitched the underarm seams of both the outer and the lining. And then I also sewed in the little elbow darts. I clipped and ironed those seams open. And then I set my lining inside my outer sleeve, right sides together, and pinned around the lower cuff. After those were stitched, I clipped around the cuff and then turned them right side out and then began pinning the loose top edges together. For the lower edge of the cuff, I just used a simple running stitch to kind of tack that down. This is the method I found for attaching sleeves that seems to be the easiest and have the most consistent best results. I'm basting around the seam, but you notice that I'm using a normal stitch length and I'm stitching it at a half of an inch instead of further in. And then I'm going to go ahead and clip all the way around this sleeve head and then serge around it, kind of stretching the clips open around the concave curves. So now you can see it's a completely finished sleeve, it just hasn't been sewn in yet. Now on the bodice arm size, I'm also going to sew a basting stitch around it. This one is also going to be at a half inch with a normal stitch length. I'm going to clip those curves as well, and then I'm going to remove all of the previous basting stitches. Now on the inside, I'm trimming down the lining and the interlining layers to a little bit less than an eighth of an inch, almost as narrow as I could go. I'm lining up the sleeve in the arm's eye, starting with the underarm seam of the sleeve and the center side that I had marked on the bodice from my pattern. At the back edge of the shoulder, I folded all of the excess into small pleats, just eyeballing it. I wasn't doing anything fancy or using math. And then I sewed around the arm's eyes. The reason I like this basting method is because everything just flexes a lot more easily when you already have the curves clipped. And then when you have those two strong basting stitches, you can kind of feel on the top and bottom of the fabric as you're sewing, and you can kind of feel that they're lining up. And when I tug and keep the fabric a little bit taut, they kind of just naturally want to stay in line with each other better. And I will just sew barely to the inside of that stitch. So it's technically going to be a little bit further in than the original half inch seam allowance, but it's like, it's not a noticeable amount. 
Now to finish these sleeves, on the inside I'm turning all of the seam allowances over towards the bodice side, and then I'm sewing them in place with a running stitch. Now you can see that everything wants to lay pretty smoothly on the inside, but it's still hanging loose. So what I do is I fold that surged edge from the sleeve back, and all that's left of the bodice seam allowance is that little silk layer, and I'm just trimming that down by about half. I don't want to cut it too short, but I do want to get rid of all of the fuzzies and make sure that it can easily hide beneath the serged seam allowance. Then I fold the serged edge back over top of that and just whip stitch it in place. And that's it. Sleeves are done. <laughs> At this point, the jacket is technically done, but of course it's it's not actually done. There's more that I want to do to it. So what I am unhappy with is the skirt. I think the skirt, I made it too long and I don't really care for the way it like drapes and sticks out. So what I decided to do about it is now that it was hanging on the mannequin, I figured I could go around and level the hem to exactly where I wanted. I'd originally thought that I wanted it longer, but I just felt like shorter was going to be a little bit better proportionally. And opening back up that bottom hem would also give me the opportunity to tweak some of the other seams. At the center side, where there was a wrinkle over the hip, I cut straight up through the skirt and opened it up and played around with the fabric to make everything sit flat. And then I took a scrap of white paper and I stuck it inside that new slit and kind of pinned it in place to make a rough pattern for the gore that I was going to insert. I pinched in the front flare. I felt like it was just way too exaggerated and it needed to kind of curve and taper in as it went down. I started by sewing in the new shape of the flares for that side front seam, and then I cut the gores out of some scrap fabric and stitched them in place. I didn't really love the look of gores and I didn't really want to do them for this project, but it is an option and it did work out and end up pretty much solving my problem. Then I did a ton of pinning. I decided that the bagged lining method had left a few wrinkly seams on the inside, so I pinned all the way down the side front seams and then I pinned in the lining for the gore and I hand stitched all of that stuff. Then I could close back up the hem, and how I did that was just by ironing up a half inch on both the silk and the lining layers, and then matching them up and pinning them together, and then restitching the hem with a whip stitch. All right, finally, I can start the trim. I'm going to be cutting the trim for this jacket using an antique pinking tool. I've had this for several years now. I bought it off of eBay when I first got really interested in 18th century costuming, and it's kind of been this guilty thing hanging over my head ever since that I've not yet used it. But the thing is, you kind of only can use it on silk, otherwise I've heard that it frays too badly. So anyways, I started this process by cutting two inch wide strips from my silk scraps. This pinking tool is an antique and the blade was a bit dull. I consulted my resident metalworking expert about that and he told me that it would be possible to sharpen it but we would basically have to soften the metal first by getting it hot and then sharpen it and then harden it again. And with such a delicate tool, I was just, I, I leave, leave well enough alone. <laughs> I figured it would be better to just use it as it was, and then maybe someday in the future, metal 3D printing will be readily enough available that I could have a replacement blade made. I just don't wanna take any chances with this one since it does still technically work. 
So you can see after I cut the sides, I have to go and kind of tear that fabric apart and it leaves behind little thready bits, which I then trimmed off. So the dull pinking tool, it does still work, but it does not give as clean of a cut as it was originally intended. Next, I took each strip and sewed them together to make one long strip. And then I measured the place where I wanted that strip of trim to sit and I doubled it to cut my length. So I will be gathering these strips and they will have a 200% fullness. Once each strip had been cut to the correct length, I took it to my sewing machine again and I ran a basting stitch down the center. I gathered it up and pinned it in place, and then I stitched them, covering the center and the gathering stitch with this bit of brown antique floral trim. Okay, so a bit of a recap for this jacket project. Let me start with my criticisms. There are a few. The biggest one is I should have done that second mock-up. I don't know. I just got cocky and overconfident and I thought that the skirt would just behave and it didn't. Um, but I would have saved so much time if I had done the second mock-up and I think I would have been slightly happier with the results. It would have just come together a little bit smoother and cleaner and I estimate that I would have saved about a full work day, <laughs> not to mention the extra fabric that I ended up cutting off of the skirt. That all went to waste, unfortunately. So that's the biggest thing. The second thing is that I would not have used the canvas linen interlining. I would have used a thinner linen that was stiffened with gum tragacanth, or I would have just used straight up modern interfacing. I like the stiffness that it gave it, but it was just so bulky and so thick to work with and uh, unnecessary. Other small critiques are, I don't really love the color of this lacing cord ribbon. I just got whatever was basic at Joann's and they only had one shade of brown, of course. Uh, so I would like to find something that matches a little bit better, but that is totally something I can do whenever. Um, also, not the jacket itself, but the stomachers, they are a little bit too narrow and they're a little bit too rounded at the corners. When I was wearing it, I noticed that most of the time you could kind of see it dipping down a bit at the corners and eh. I do still have a decent amount of scrap fabric of all of the colors except for maybe the brown. So at some point I might remake those stomachers and just make them wider and a little bit sharper of a corner. Uh, but they work, they work for now. But for the positives, I love the trim. When I first finished the trim, I was a little bit unsure and I even thought that I might just rip it all right back off because when it's hanging on the mannequin, it just looked a little bit like odd and out of place. I don't know why. But when I was wearing it on myself and I saw it moving in action and then I saw the video footage of myself actually wearing it, it looks great. I love it. And the other thing that I love is how much fun it was to mitch match this jacket with the two petticoats and then with the four stomacher options. It's gonna be even more fun once I finish all of the accessories, the jewelry, the fichus, the hats, caps. It's gonna be, it's gonna be great when I have even more color variations going on in there. I really like the overall effect that it has. I think the like noob idea of wealthy people's historical clothing is like a lot of bright colors and shiny silks and satins. And this to me, it is a bit shiny, but it's a little bit more of a muted shine. It's a very rich, deep brown color. Plus with all of the trim. I don't know, maybe my idea isn't particularly accurate either, but it definitely fits my like imagery in my head of what an actual upper middle class person might have worn like to a market. The only downside is that I, if you remember the beginning of the video, I was talking about how I wanted to do this efficiently and get it done quickly so that I had time to make two other dresses. Well, I definitely don't have time to make the third dress, but the second dress that I had been planning on wearing to the ball, I don't know if I'm gonna have time to make that either. So, eh, I don't know, because I've got deadlines on other things I need to finish. But the good news is, if I don't have time to make that dress, 
it's pretty fancy looking. I think that I would be happy wearing this to the ball. It's not a gown, but it looks very fine. It looks good. I'd be happy wearing it. So I think that that is going to be it for this video. I am going to take you on a small chicken update now because there are some exciting things going on in the backyard. Okay, big things happening. First of all, look at that. We have started tearing down the deck. We took down the porch tree and it will not be growing back this time. Oh yeah, look at that. <laughs> We're supposed to be getting in the materials to build a new one in about a week. First of all, I have a very special surprise. My ugliest and meanest chicken, Nurse Ratchet. <laughs> Hello there. Hi, Ratchet. How are your babies? Do they need some more food? Are they not so cute? Sorry. Look at them! And then look at that little black one! So that little black one is Ratchet's baby mixed with Goose, or I am Kamani. And that little black one, he's so tiny. The blonde ones, their, their rooster has to be Clyde, um, who we no longer have because he was uh, very violent. But I don't know who the females are, because I wasn't, you know, seeing which eggs each one was coming out of. Update number two! <gasps> This is Disco. <laughs> I'll show you some video footage. We got her from Caleb's parents' house. Another bird showed up on their property. This time we actually asked the neighbors if they wanted their chicken back. And they're basically like, uh, we have a lot of chickens. We're not about to go chase a chicken around your yard. So we did. And we got the chicken. <laughs> Caleb's going to go the other way. By the garden. Oh, we got him! Oh, he's beautiful, or she. Look, Lincoln. <gasps> Look. Mara will help it feel better. Oh, he's beautiful. Hi, friend. Chicken. So oh, did sweet. You get that blanket? Yeah. I went around the corner and he like saw me. And like Hi, Ophelia. Hi, pretty girl. Yes, yeah, she wants some food. But yeah, we got another free bird. <laughs> We're not entirely sure how old she is because she's very small and she hasn't started laying any eggs yet and she makes young sounding noises. Um, but she has a red wattle, so I'm gonna guess she's like a spring chicken from this year and she's just a smaller breed. So that's update number two. Um, Ophelia is pretty much perfectly healed up. She's doing quite well and she's integrating with the big chickens now that the um, very aggressive roosters are all gone. Hi, pretty girl. Do you want some berries? You want a snack? Another fun update, we've discovered that this little forest is absolutely full of these berries. And I Googled them, they're called autumn olives and they are an invasive species. Here you go, Ophelia. Here you go, get some berries. Whoop. They are perfectly edible, and I had a few, but I didn't really care for them. But the chickens love them. Ophelia is spoiled. <laughs> Knock some down for the big birds. This is the fourth species of berry that we found growing wild on this one acre of property. Yeah, the chickens have started climbing these trees a little bit, trying to get to the berries. Other updates, most of my bareback hens are actually growing feathers back now that we are down by a few roosters. Um, some, like, look at her, she's molting. Um, others, like that brown one, she has not started to molt yet, so it'll take a while for her feathers to grow back. Um, that brown one right there, she was completely barebacked. So yeah, things are kind of cozying down for the fall. We got this one last batch of babies with Ratchet. Oh, I forgot to bring Ratchet berries. She's making angry noises at me. Here you go, Ratchet. Listen to those noises. She makes the same noises that the roosters will make. 
But see how the black one can't hardly eat them? He's so small, he can't swallow them whole like the others can. <laughs> yeah, Ratchet will kind of chew on them, like break them open and spit them back out so the babies can swallow them easier. Turkey's not loving them having all this attention. <laughs> Oh, poor black one. I keep stealing him to try and give him snacks and he won't eat them because he's freaked out. <laughs> Actually, Ratchet is starting to grow some feathers in. Yeah, all right. She'll have feathers in a couple months. Hi, turkey. Yes, pretty girl, you're still my favorite. Good girl.